Okay, welcome everybody to our Scaling Networks class for 11917. Thank you for attending. Quick message, I'll let you know next week we will not be having a class meeting because I will be traveling. So be aware of that. I just want you to be continuing moving forward and working on course content. I will send out the meeting items for the following week, which is Thanksgiving week, uh, today or tomorrow. Be aware that we will have this class scaling and connecting meetings on Tuesday instead of Thursday of that week because I don't think any of you are going to meet with me on Thanksgiving. And quite honestly, I'm not going to meet with you on Thanksgiving either. So um, we'll do your meetings earlier in the week and knock those out. So if you have any questions, you can do those. What I want to do today is we had an entire discussion last week on the difference, different types of routing protocols, link state versus disinfector interior gateway protocols, exterior gateway protocols. What we're going to do today is we're going to move into looking at what used to be called a hybrid protocol, but is really just a disinfector routing protocol. It's an advanced disinfector routing protocol, uh, but it's EIGRP, which is Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol. And if IGRP still existed, EIGRP is backwards compatible. Uh, the actual metric for EIGRP is 255 times uh, IGRP's metric, that's how they make them backwards and compatible with each other. But don't worry about that because IGRP is no longer even in the ILS, so you couldn't run it if you wanted to. EIGRP is a Cisco proprietary protocol. However, they have uh, released the standards out and are trying to get it to be adopted as a standards-based protocol, but I don't think it ever happened because most people, if they're running multi-vendor environments, are going to run OSPF. Um, EIGRP is a classless routing protocol. Can anybody remember what, when I say a class, classless routing protocol, what is the main determining factor? So classless routing protocol. The VLSM, CIDR. It does support VLSM, support CIDR. But what makes it classless? What does it carry? That's how subnet mask. Subnet yep. mask. Okay, subnet mask information. In the route updates. Okay. And that is how it supports VLSM, CIDR, and all those. Okay. If it's class full, remember it does not. Does not carry subnet mask information in route table updates. Okay. RIP version one. Right, RIP v1, uh, IGRP was classful, um, but now EIGRP and IGRP for version six, both are classless. So it is a distance vector routing protocol, so it's an interior gateway protocol and it is distance vector even though it is a very advanced distance vector routing protocol uh, because of the concept of well, a couple of things. One, the fused update algorithm. It has an algorithm that it uses to uh, create a loop-free topology path. So, excuse me, unlike real, EIGRP does have a topology table. Um, it has neighbor adjacency, so it does understand that it has neighbors, but it still builds that topology table based on information of just from its neighbors. So. It's still looking at a distance vector type algorithm versus a link state protocol that has an overall view of the network itself. Now, iOS 15 and higher has a new thing called named EIGRP. Um, it can be used for IPv4 and IPv6 under a single configuration mode. This way you don't have to configure EIGRP for four and six separately. Um, it is not in this course, but be aware if you see that named EIGRP, it is a way for you to enable EIGRP and then allow it to run for both v4 and v6 in what's called a dual stack environment when you're running both IPv4 and IPv6 protocol stacks on a machine. EIGRP uses its own layer 4 protocol. It's called the RTP, or Reliable Transport Protocol. Uh, because of that, it can use what's called a protocol dependent modules to allow it to run in IPv6, IPv4, Apple Talk, et cetera. So EIGRP supported multiple protocols at layer three. It does use what are called partial and bounded updates. In other words, it doesn't send out periodic uh, updates if there's no change. 
but it will uh, send them out if a change occurs. So it's not like RIP. RIP sends its entire route table every 30 seconds regardless. EIGRP doesn't do that. EIGRP is designed to do partial and bounded updates, only send out changes when they occur. It does support unequal cost load balancing. In fact, it is one of the few that does. Um, OSPF will support equal cost load balancing. EIGRP does also support equal cost, but with the variance command, EIGRP can support what's called unequal cost load balancing. In other words, I could say, if these two links are within this variance of one another, then load balance across both of them. So it is not a hybrid. It has been, if you get an older book and you look at it, in fact, I wrote a book for a company and in that book, I refer to EIGRP as a hybrid routing protocol because even Cisco was doing that in their documentation, um, but it's not. Uh, it is a distance vector routing protocol. An advanced one, but it's still distance vector. You'll notice that there are PDMs, and PDMs are protocol dependent modules that allow you to support multiple layer three protocols with EIGRP. In this day and age, we're really only going to use the PDMs for IPv4 or IPv6. You also notice that immediately versus RIP, there are there are multiple tables. So you're going to see that the IGRP takes up more um, router memory because you've got a neighbor table, you've got a topology table, and you've got a routing table. So you've got to have multiple different tables. Right there. It was talking about how to describe it. Larry, I, I, I muted you. Let me know when you want back in. I'll, I'll unmute you. Okay. RTP, again, you'll see here, RTP is the layer four transport protocol that is used by um, EIGRP. It is reliable because a large amount of, R of EIGRP communications are using the reliable transport. And name it. Okay. So, um, EIGRP does use the multicast address of 224.0010. Uh, our, remember, RIP v2 uses 224.009, and it uses the IPv6 multicast address of FF02 colon colon A. Like most modern routing protocols, EIGRP supports authentication, which is very important. You can authenticate, let me go back and say, you can authenticate peers so that you only send uh, or only accept route table updates from an authenticated peer. There are multiple different types of packets that are sent in EIGRP. One is just the hello packet, and that's used for neighbor discovery and to maintain adjacencies. In other words, to say, hey, I'm up, I'm working. Are you there? I'm up, I'm working. Um, there are update packets, which are sent with reliable delivery. So if I send an update, that update must be acknowledged, okay? So an ACK, and an ACK is unreliable, as you would expect. Query packets and reply packets are reliable. So if you look at the five different types of packets, only hello and acknowledgement are not acknowledged, they're not reliably sent. Updates, queries, and replies are all sent with reliable delivery. So you have to be aware that they will result in acts occurring, okay? EIGRP IPv4 over IPv4 uses uh, protocol 88 to send the, say that I'm sending a uh, EIGRP update or EIGRP message, IPv6, same thing says protocol 88 is used to define or show that it's EIGRP. Now, hello packets are sent depending on the link speed. They're sent either, either every five seconds or 60 seconds by default. If it's a high speed in, uh, interface, so an interface greater than 1.544 megabits per second, it's sent every five seconds, and it's considered the whole time is 15 seconds or three times the uh, default hello interval. Um, EIGRP is different than OSPF because if you have different hello intervals set, and you can change these, only suggested you change them if you are told to do so by Cisco support. But if you change them, okay, with EIGRP, you do not have to have, I unmuted you later, by the way, so if you need to say something, I'm sorry. Um, if you need to use a different hello time timer, you can change it. If it doesn't match on two routers, they will actually negotiate down to the lowest. They will still form neighbor adjacencies, though. 
So EIGRP can have neighbors with different hello and hold time intervals, and they will negotiate an interval with each other. OSPF will not work, period, if you have different hello and hold times on an interface. So be aware of that. Um, again, acknowledgments. If you send an update, it will be acknowledged. If you send a query, it will be acknowledged. Um, so a query is going to be acknowledged. So used to form neighbor adjacencies have been hello packet, confirms the receipt, they've been acknowledgement. Sent to neighbors an alternate route to a network is required. That's probably a query packet. Bing. Got it right. So hello packets form neighbor adjacencies, acknowledgements, confirm receipt, query, send neighbors when an alternate route is required. In other words, the neighbor says, hey, I need a route to block. And that's the query packet. The reply is the reply to the query, and then update is about a network to a new neighbor. So it sends it out to a new neighbor. This gets extremely detailed, and I'm not real sure why they do this in the CCMA, but here it is. They get all the way down into here's your data link header, your IP header, 224.0.0.10, protocol 88, then you've got the EIGRP opcode, autonomous system number and then all the way down to your internal or external routes. The only thing this really is important for for us is you will eventually learn that there are D routes, which are EIGRP routes because it uses the dual algorithm. And there are DEX routes, and those are external routes or routes redistributed into EIGRP and uh, from a different autonomous system or from a different protocol. And those are DEX, so those are marked as external routes. So they're zero by 103 routes. You don't have to remember all these things here. Uh, the important thing is if the autonomous system number doesn't match between multiple routers. They will not exchange information with each other. It's that simple. But here's something else to remember. It's not really an autonomous system number. It's really just a process ID. And even simpler than that, it's more like a Windows workgroup name because it's just what is used so that they will actually send information between one another. This is a little bit important because it shows you the different um, values used in the metric, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But it all comes down to in the metric that it's uh, bandwidth plus the sum of the delays, and we'll talk about that. Okay, prefix length, destination, so we're getting to it carries the uh, subnet mask information, number of network bits in the subnet mask. So you'll see that that's being carried by an internal route. External route, same thing, still got that, but it's got more information about what the external protocol is, um, the originating AS, so if it's, obviously it's out external AS because it's external route. <clears throat> so here's our network we're going to build and we're going to configure. You've got to put your IP addresses on it first. Obviously, if IP is not working, nothing else is going to work. Now, the AS, again, it's not really an AS, okay? It is more a process ID. In fact, they can talk about it as you read through here. It's really just a process ID, uh, kind of like an OSPF process ID. Now, the only difference between the AS, autonomous system number, and EIGRP, and the process ID and OSPF is this. The AS number must match between routers that you want to share EIGRP information. In OSPF, the process ID doesn't have to match. So, again, it goes back to, to really being it's more of a work group name or work group number than anything else for this AS. So if you do router EIGRP, it's going to turn it on, but then you have to put in your AS number. So router EIGRP1, and it needs to match across all the routers that you want to share information with each other. So in this case, R1, 2, and 3 all want to be part of the EIGRP. Now, just like any other routing protocol, I guarantee you you're going to turn it on, and what do you think you're going to do next? Do what? Oh, you're going to go ahead and start assigning actual networks that you want to see. Exactly. You turn it on, then you've got to go in and set your networks you're going to um, you're going to advertise. So we'll advertise R1, R2. It's NRAS. We'll do something weird with this. We'll show you that. 
We also do have a concept that's not as big a deal in the IGRP as it is in OSPF. It's called Router ID. And this is used um, as part of the Hello Packets and also as the originating ID and route uh, queries or excuse me, updates. By default, uh, you can either set it with this EIGRP router ID command, or it's the highest loopback address that's configured, or it's the highest IP address on any active interface. Again, it's not as big a deal on EIGRP as it is on OSPF, um, but they teach you to do it just because of simplicity's sake. So you just go in and router EIGRP1, EIGRP router ID 1111-2222-3333, and that sets it on all the routers so that you, <clears throat> you've got it set. Okay. Then go into use your network command. So there's a couple ways you can do the network command. One is you can go in and just do the major network number. Okay. And this will then enable EIGRP on all the networks in that major network. Now, granted, and remember, this is still a classless routing protocol. Even though you put in a classical network, it goes and looks at the interfaces, finds some mask on those interfaces, and only advertises those full networks. It's not going to advertise this entire network. Okay. So on R1, it would only advertise this slash 24, the slash 30, and the slash 30 with these commands. Okay. You also have the ability, if for some reason you don't want to advertise a network, in other words, for some reason you don't want to advertise 172.16.0.0, you don't want to advertise every network that's on here okay now obviously it doesn't really matter right now but let's imagine there's a uh 172.16.3.0 excuse me it's already up here let's do it 100.0 out here you didn't want to advertise that you wouldn't want to use command network 172.16.0.0 because it advertised all of them you can use wildcard mask you can go in and say network 192.168.10.8 which in this case that's this network right here the dot eight network now I'm going to use a wildcard mask, and then I'll advertise only that one network, nothing else. In most cases, it's best to go ahead and do that, to advertise your individual networks with wildcard mask. That way you ensure you're not accidentally advertising something you shouldn't, and you have complete control over. Other items that are a big deal, uh, this is something that was in RIP, but passive interfaces. By default, every five seconds, R1 and R3 will be sending hellos out gig zero zero if you enabled EIGRP on that network. Well, there are no EIGRP neighbors out there. So why send those out every five seconds? So we can go in and create a passive interface, passive interface gig zero zero, and that will mean it will not send hellos out that interface. Now, we'll listen for them, but it will not send them out. This command should only ever be put on a port that is not going to have a an EIGRP neighbor on. Also helps with security because nobody can sit out there and grab your hello packets and look at them. You do a show IP protocols, it will show your passive interfaces. There's also a command called passive interface default. It will make all interfaces default, and then you turn the interfaces you don't want to be passive, uh, you set them not to be passive. Show IP IGRP neighbor shows us our neighbors, shows you what interface, your local interface is receiving that neighbor information and your hold time, how long it's been up, and then there's other items in here like a smooth round trip timer, um, and that's used for reliable packets, queue count, sequence numbers, all those things. So queue, can, queue counts ever more than zero, something's messed up. Show IP protocols will show your autonomous system number. Again, that's where people mess up a lot of times. You and your neighbor uh, set it to different numbers and it will not work. Here's your router ID. Here, by the way, is the uh, administrative distance for internal EIGRP routes and the administrative distance for external. And then automatic summarization is disabled by default. It used to be in the old days before iOS 15. You actually have to do no auto summary because EIGRP would work like a class full routing protocol. It doesn't do that anymore, though. Thank goodness. And you can see here how they put in the major networks for routing. They did not use wildcard math. Here's our IEDs. I think I've seen this chart about 10 times now in my studies throughout this course. So that's just an indicator that you might want to commit it to memory, at least the ones that are highlighted and OSPIT.
They use those in interview questions too a lot. Do what? <laughs> they use those uh, administrative distances for uh, interview questions a lot too. Oh yeah, definitely. They're they're definitely on uh, questions. Yep. So look at the route table. Show IP route. You'll see D routes, and again, that is because it uses the dual algorithm. It's using the update algorithm. Okay. So showing your routes on our network here, and we'll go through now. Neighbor adjacencies. Again, this is the hello packet. I'm here. Is anybody there? Yep. And here's my routing information. Uh, and it sends out to anybody out, and then they'll send their update. So this is on the initial boot up. And two neighbors find each other, they will send hellos and then send updates to figure out adjacencies. Once that's taken care of, they'll start sending their updates and they'll exchange their uh, topology tables. And when they did it, you'll see this update here goes across. That update is actually ACT because remember, updates, the yeah, IDRP updates are acknowledged, and vice versa when R1 sends an update. Okay, which is a reply to the hello from R2, that information will be acknowledged by R2. So updates are acknowledged. And updates are used in the beginning process to exchange information. Down the road, uh, let's say there's a change. Okay, This is an example of just convergence. Everybody ends up with the same information. And then they can build their topology tables and build their route tables. And here's the metric that is used by EIGRP. There are multiple items in the metric. There's bandwidth, there's load, there's delay, reliability, and MTU. There's actually an MTU, which I don't see where they put that in here. But all of these values end up being zeros, which means when you multiply it by zero, in this case, if K, if, um, K2 is multiplied by zero, you get zero, okay? It ends up being bandwidth plus the sum of the delay. That's how you get your metric. You can modify these values, but you don't do this unless you have a very specific reason. And if you do modify them, you should modify them on all the routers in your network. Otherwise, you have routers making calculations for EIGRP using different metrics, so you can get some very weird routing paths. If you want to see a metric value, you can do uh, show interface and you can see the bandwidth and the delay. And it shows you the delay. That's in microseconds. If for some reason you want, uh, you don't have a full T1 link, by the way, by default on all serial interfaces, Cisco routers assume that the interface is 1.544 megabits per second. If you've got a FRAC T1 or you've got a smaller link between the sites, if you do not change the bandwidth on it, it will make calculations for EIGRP based upon that default of 1.544. So you actually have to go in and change the bandwidth on the interface so that it can make the correct calculations. That way the bandwidth will be correct. It's also important that you set it the same on both sides. Make sure that if this is a 64K link, you set the bandwidth on R1 and R2 to both be 64. Here's your delay metric, and you can see what the delay and uh, microseconds are for different links. You can see those there when you look at an interface. I like this. Cisco recommends not delaying the uh, not changing the delay parameter. In other words, you can do this, but don't do it. <laughs> so to get your metric, you take 10,000 divided by the bandwidth plus the sum of the delay times 256. Now this 256 is how you uh, how you would keep compatibility with IGRP in the past uh, equals the metric. You end up with a really big number. Okay. So when you start looking at, at calculating the metric, you can go and look. The bandwidth is 1024. Okay, so you take 10, 10 million divided by 1024, which gets you this. All right, so you round it down to 9765. You then take your delay and add them together. So 20,000 plus 10, that's our delay in the entire length, 2001. And then you take the bandwidth plus the delay times 256, and you get a metric of 3,012,096. And so all that was accomplished by looking at the link 
looking at the bandwidth on the link, okay, and this is between R2 and R3, and then looking at the delay on the links. And you'll see it's a big number. I have you do a couple examples of that. Any questions so far? No, it's a lot of information, but I think it's okay. It is a lot. And this is, dual is a little bit weird, but it, it, it's, it's one of those things where the algorithm is not as complicated as you think. It is designed, what, what dual does, the algorithm is designed to help you find loop-free paths and then loop-free backup paths that can be placed immediately into the route table. If a, uh, if the, a route goes down. Now, what we have in, in EIGRP under dual is we have what's called successors. I'll go ahead and tell you, successors are best paths. That's the best path to a network. A feasible successor we'll talk about This is a backup path in the topology table that meets, and we'll talk about this, meets, golly, I cannot type, the feasibility condition, feasibility condition, okay? And we'll talk about the feasibility condition in just a minute, okay? We've also got reported distance, which is the advertised distance. And that's the distance that a router reports that it has to it. And so then we'll we'll talk about this condition in just a second because it's, it's, it's one of those things that's a little difficult until you kind of look at it. Now, dual is a finite state machine, so it just goes through a set of, of states to figure out the best path. What I want to do is this. First off, Successor and feasible distance. The feasible distance is the lowest calculated metric to reach the destination network. It is in the route table. So that is what's in the route table. So when we look here, we look at the route to this network right here, okay? Our feasible distance is that best path, the route. In this case, the metric was 3,012,096. Okay, so that's the feasible distance from R2 to the 192.168.10 network. Now you notice there's a backup path that goes this way, but it can only be a feasible successor if it meets the feasibility condition. Okay, so let's talk about this feasibility condition. The feasibility condition is the reported distance must be less than the feasible distance. So for the, this is called the feasibility condition, also called FC, okay, FC, is the reported distance must be less than the feasible distance. Now, I know you're sitting there going, what do you mean? All right, so let's look at this network. R2, R2's feasible distance, to the 192.168.1.0 network was the 3 million, was it 12, 3 million, go back and find it, 3 million, 12,000, 3 million, 12,096. Okay. 3 million, 12,096. So that's my, my best route from R2 to that network. Okay, it's three million. In order for this path to be a feasible successor, to stay in the table as a feasible successor, R3's reported distance, so that's the distance that R1 reports that it can get to this network, must be less than three million, 12,000, 096. Now, you're looking at me going, uh, okay, why? What does that matter? Well, let's do this in simple terms. Let's make it, 
less than this. Let's just say that for whatever reason, okay, if R2, well, we can go like this. If R1 went from here to R2 over to R1, in other words, if R3's reported distance or R3's path to this network went back through R2, in other words, a, a loop, okay? So if R2 thought that the R3's route was a feasible successor and it was actually a loop, R3's path to the 192.168.1 network would have to have a reported distance greater than 3012 because the best path that R2 has to this network is 3012. 3 million 12, excuse me. 3 million 12,000. However, as we look here, okay, and we see that the reported distance for R1 is actually, okay, R3, excuse me, in this case, R1, not R1. God, mess that up, sorry. R1's reported distance is 2 million, okay. 170,112. Now, so R1 tells R2 that my best path to this network is 2,170,112 metrics worth away. Well, guess what? There is no possible way that R1's path goes back through R2. Why? Because the, the distance between R2 and R3 is already encapsulated, so it has to be more than it. And then exactly. It the so best path that R2 has to this network is 3,012,000. If R1's path actually to this network went through R2, it would be at least 3,012,000. So because this path, this backup path, meets the feasibility condition, okay? In other words, R1's reported distance is less than R2's feasible distance. This is a feasible successor. And if you go in the topology table, it's a feasible successor. That's important because if this link right here goes down, if there's a feasible successor in the topology table, it's immediately placed into the route table with no recalculation at all. So you'll see R1's reported distance is less than the feasible distance for R2. Therefore, it is a feasible successor. Okay. And you'll notice if this link goes down, R2 would immediately start sending things through R1 because that feasible successor existed. Now, what would happen if for some reason, R1 did not meet the feasibility condition, but you still had this network set up. You still had these paths set up. Anybody know? What would happen is this. There would be no feasible successor in the in the topology table. Oh, yeah, but, the right. right, R2 would just have to go through the full dual algorithm again, and it would eventually find this path and place it in the route table but it wouldn't be immediate. The concept of feasibility, the feasible successor and the feasibility condition is what makes EIGRP so fast in terms of bringing up backup routes. Because if a route is a feasible successor, then it can immediately go into the route table. If it's not, you just have to go through the entire dual algorithm again and eventually find that network. So that's the entire dual algorithm and the concept of feasible successor and feasibility. If you're a feasible successor, it means that the reported distance is less than the feasible distance. And that's what's happened here. R1's reported distance, now I know it says feasible distance, but that's R1's feasible distance is the reported distance it tells its neighbors. So the reported distance it gives to R2 is, hey, I can get there in 2,170,112. Well, R2 knows, well, there's no way you're coming through me because my best path is 3,012,096. And it meets the feasibility condition. It took me a very long time to figure this out. 
Um, and the fact that it, that it, you know, what, what it meant by the feasibility condition and how it worked. The, the fact is, feasible successes make EIGRP very, very fast. You can also do show IP EIGRP topology, and you'll see here the topology. By the way, in this case, uh, passive is good. Passive means it is a good thing. Uh, if it's active, it means it's running through the dual algorithm. Sorry, Sandella, what did you say? Oh, I was just talking about, yeah, because you can end up in a situation where you can have a, a router uh, get stuck in active. Yep, yep. And it's basically, if it's stuck in active, it's sitting there constantly trying to run the dual algorithm, or it's run the dual algorithm and not been successful for some reason. So passive is good. If it's passive, it's stable. If it's active, it's in a current state of running through the dual algorithm. Okay. So we see here a passive route. And we see uh, our different successors. In this case, we've got two successors. Okay, we've got one successor and a feasible successor. And you know that because you can see the reported distance is less than the feasible distance. So there's our feasible successor. If there's no feasible successor in the topology table, this is what it will look like. And you will have to go through the dual algorithm, okay? Uh, when the link goes down. This is the dual finite state machine. Basically, if you lose connectivity to the successor, if there is a feasible successor, it goes into the route, it promotes it, goes in the routing table, boom, you're good. If there's no feasible successor, then it goes in place of that network in an active state, queries the neighbors for a new route, and then if it finds a new route, it will create a new successor route. If it doesn't, it will take it out of the route table once the whole timer has been expired. So here we have an example of a feasible successor. And you'll see it go through. There's a successor and a feasible successor. As soon as the link goes down, it goes through and finds uh, the feasible successor and immediately puts it into the route table. So it removes one route and installs another route immediately. Okay, and then you have the one successor route. There's no feasible successor. Look at the difference. Okay, it goes in. Network's gone. Okay, so it takes it out, and it has to send out destination active. So it's sending out, hey, anybody else know how to get to this network? Mm -hmm. It's got to get replies. It's got to do finding the feasible successor for that particular network, looking at the feasible distance, and then it goes through and removes it, and then it finally puts it in the route table. And there's time in between here where it's doing all of its querying of its neighbors and finding out how the best, how to, what the best path is. By the way, the way they're showing this is by debugging the EIGRP FSM. I'd be careful on a, on a production network doing this because you never know what might happen in terms of the amount of router resources that would use. Now, EIGRP for V6 works exactly the same. There's a neighbor table, topology table, and a routing table. The difference is that um, EI GRP for V6 uses a different multicast address. It does use a 32-bit router ID, which is weird, but it does. Um, but other than that, they're pretty much exactly the same. Okay. I will say that IP V6 is a little easier. Um, you do use link local addresses for source and destination. Usually it's either the link local or it can be the, the um, multicast address. But the big thing here is actually configuring it. Here's our topology. They just went with the cafes. Put all your IP addresses on it just like before. Then you go in and put in link local addresses so you've got those link locals. Now one of the things about link local discussion again, we always assign the same link local address on every interface on a router because it's only locally significant. That way it just makes it easier for us. So R1's got link local on all the interfaces of FE80 colon colon one. R2 is colon colon two and R3 will be colon colon three. And that's only used on that local configuration. Then you go into IPv6 router EIGRP 
And it will tell you it's not enabled because you got to first turn on unicast routing. You got to turn on IPv6 routing. Then you go IPv6 router at EIGRP. And then you can put in your router ID, which is crazy that you're in IPv6, but you're using a 32 bit uh, router ID, but that's what's called for in the route table updates and that portion of that update. Then you do no shutdown to bring it up. And then this is where it gets a little weird. You don't put your network numbers under IPv, uh, EIGRP for IPv6. What you do is you then go, okay, so you got your autonomous system number. Once you turn it on, you then go to the interface and associate that interface with that process. So interface gig 00, zero IPv6 EIGRP2. This will then advertise every IPv6 network on that interface. The neat thing is, since you're not doing network commands, you don't have to worry about uh, if you change IP addresses on the interfaces. They will automatically be sent out as advertisements. So I think it's actually a little bit easier because you just enable IPv6 or EIGRP for IPv6, and then you apply it or associate it. I like to call it associate it with the, with the interfaces. You can go show IPv6 EIGRP neighbor table. Looks exactly the same as before, except it's got link local addresses. Show, IP proto show IPv6 protocols, exact same thing. Shows you your AS number, shows your uh, K values for your metric. Router ID shows you what interfaces you're routing for, which is, again, a little bit different than the other. It doesn't show your networks, it shows the interfaces. Then the route table, you just have D routes and DEX routes, so it's exactly the same. So you end up with your, your routes. And that, folks, is EIGRP in a nutshell. Are there any questions on EIGRP? I know it is a little bit difficult to kind of wrap your head around the feasibility condition. Uh, read back through that and just remember, Feasibility condition means that the reported distance is less than the feasible distance, and it must be less. If it was equal, you could possibly be going back through that uh, the router, but as long as it's less, there's no way you can have a loop because you're not going back through uh, the router you're reporting your distance to. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to stop my recorder and ask you if you have any questions.